Well, hey there, folks. Um, today's topic is the Konica Auto Reflex T2. Um, let's talk about this particular camera. The Konica Auto Reflex T2 uh, was produced from 1970 to 1973. It was the flagship of Konica's SLR line during this period. Uh, it was considered a semi-pro or an advanced amateur uh, was the terminology we, that, that uh, folks used back then. Nowadays we say prosumer. Back then it was just either semi-pro or advanced amateur. Uh, not quite professional level, but uh, next level down. Uh, it was preceded by the Auto Reflex T1, um, although both the T1 and the T2 are officially just the T. You'll notice that here on the front of the camera it simply says T. There's no number next to the T. Um, and that's, well, that's just, that's just the way it is. Um, although they're easily, easily distinguishable by the location of the on-off switch. So, on the Auto Reflex T2, right here, the on-off switch. Let's see if I can get a little better focus on the camera. There we go, that's a little better. So, the on-off switch is right here. Uh, L stands for lock. You press that and the shutter function is locked out. So even if I can't release the shutter, turn the little um, turn the little indicator to the red dot, and it is now functioning. Okay, so that's the on-off switch and shutter lockout function on the T2 is right there. On the T, you've got an on-off switch um, right here in this area in the back of the camera, and there is no shutter lockout function. Um, uh, now the T2 was followed by the T3. Um, and I'm assuming that's because by that time everybody was referring to version 1 of the Auto Reflex T as the T2 and version 2 of the Auto Reflex uh, T as the T2. Um, or perhaps it's a chicken egg issue, right? I mean, maybe Konica just decided to name this to T3 and then everybody decided to um, apply numbers 1 and 2 to the versions of the preceding model, but whatever. Um, that's the terminology that's accepted nowadays. Uh, let me refocus this. It's a little annoying, isn't it? Excuse me. Okay. Um, so the Auto Reflex series belongs to the built like a tank genre of 35mm uh, cameras which were popular during the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, these, um, uh, these cameras included uh, uh, models such as the Pentax Spotmatic, the Minolta SRT series, the Canon FT and FTB, the Olympus OM-1, although this was a miniaturized version, it nonetheless does share the, um, share the, uh, the, the common feature set with the so-called Built Like a Tank series, uh, or not series, the Built Like a Tank um, genre or classification or group, um, and the Nichromat and others. This list is representative, not exhaustive. So the features of the built like a tank um, cameras of that period, generally speaking, you're talking about shutter speeds from one second to one one thousandth of a second plus B. Uh, overwhelmingly metal construction, very little plastic used in construction of these cameras. Uh, they featured entirely mechanical operation. The battery was only used to power the light meter. Um, and they were designed for mercury batteries, uh, which powered uh, cadmium sulfide uh, photocells. Uh, most of these cameras also featured depth of field preview, self timer, and mirror lockup. Although on many of these cameras, the self timer and mirror lockup functions were bundled, uh, and sometimes uh, one or more of these features were left out on the on the, the budget models. I know there there were some low end SRT um, cameras that didn't have the um, some of these and. Um, well, anyway, just not, not to overstate the case. So, what are the unique features of the Auto Reflex T2? What differentiates it from the other built like a tank cameras which I mentioned? Uh, first and foremost, it uses a copal square shutter um, that is shared with the Nichromat. So it's not completely unique to the Auto Reflex, it's unique to the Auto Reflex. And within this grouping, it would be unique to the Auto Reflex and the Nichromat. Um, and possibly, I think there may have been some N42 mount SLRs which were metal bodied and had a um, scopal square shutter possibly made by Cosina. I'm not entirely certain. Um, anyway, but the, um, the copal square shutter was, is a standout feature on the auto reflex. Likewise, now this is complete, completely unique to the auto reflex. Uh, the needle capture shutter priority automatic exposure system. So the um, uh, the 
Auto reflex cameras feature a needle on the right hand side of the viewfinder that moves up and down indicating the proper um, aperture. And when you depress the uh, shutter release button, a, a little metal arm physically grabs, you've got the needle moving up and down like so, then some arm comes out and f physically grabs the needle um, and holds it so that uh, it now knows uh, what the aperture is and communicates that information mechanically to the lens. Um, it's, a, um, it's a fascinating little setup, entirely mechanical, no electronics involved. Um, the, also, the Auto Reflex series and the Conic SLRs in general feature the shortest film to flange distance of any major brand. That is significant because there are adapters available. They're not easy to find, but they're out there. There are adapters available which will let you mount just about any lens onto the auto reflex camera. Uh, film to flange simply means the distance between the flange would be this part here, and the film obviously is, you know, your film plane is going to get well. The film plane is here. Okay, so here's your film plane, and here's your flange. The flange is, is where the, um, you know, where the lens mount is. So the distance between that and your film plane on a Konica is much, much shorter than, than other SLRs of the period. Um, I know that Konica made a, an M42 adapter, so you can get Konica factory made M42 adapters to let you mount M42 lenses onto your auto reflex. And I believe there are other adapters available for other brands. They're not particularly common. Uh, they're not particularly easy to find, but if you run across them, just buy one. <laughs> um, I'd love to have an M42 and I haven't, I haven't uh, found one yet. Um, it also features the InstaGrip film loading, which was a proprietary um, feature of Konica cameras of that period. I have done a separate video on loading film into the auto reflex uh, using this camera um, as, a, um, as a demonstrator, so please see that video for loading film. Uh, right. So let's take a look inside the viewfinder of the auto reflex and see what do you see. So you, this is just a, a page out of the owner's manual, out of the owner's manual which I printed. So you've got your um, display on the right hand side, which shows you your apertures going, uh, going from 1.4 to 16, and this needle is going to move up and down. And when you press the shutter release, again, some little mechanical arm behind the scenes over here grabs that needle and communicates that information to the lens to shut the to, to set the aperture. Um, the red, um, these are translucent red uh, plastic little flags here, um, which indicate the maximum aperture of the lens in use. So if you were using say, an f2.8 lens, then that little red um, uh, uh, marker would, would descend a little bit lower down to the 2.8. Um, likewise, you've got, I believe that's the, oh God, I'm not sure what that is. I think that's the index mark for match for for stop down metering. I'm not sure entirely. Um, honestly, I haven't fixed the meter on my camera. Um, it uh, I have not uh, calibrated the meter or converted it for mercury batteries. I just use it meterless, so I haven't used these features in a while. Um, I used to have a, a, a T2, which was uh, voltage converted and calibrated. So you've got here is the uh, shutter speed in use displayed at the bottom of the viewfinder. That's a nice feature. You also have the microprism spot in the center. Uh, some cameras of the period had a split image range finder focusing aid in the center. The T2 simply had the microprism spot. I believe a, a, you, you could substitute a split image range finder focusing aid for the microprism, but my understanding is that was a fairly rare option and the vast majority of T2s came with simply the microprism spot. Um, you also have the, this, this circle um, and the ground glass focusing field. So for example, uh, when I was shooting this camera with the, um, uh, with the 200 millimeter f3.5, uh, at maximum aperture 3.5, it's a little difficult to use the, um, the microprism. It kind of blacks out a little bit uh, in certain lighting conditions. So uh, I was often using the, this area here for focusing. Um, it, it's just a ground glass circle. Uh, that's around the um, uh, the microprism donut, and um, it just um, it is, it's another focusing aid, and, and it worked rather well. Um, I got good results with it. So uh, I mean that, and that was focusing a 200 millimeter f 3.5 lens at maximum aperture um, with a live model at a workshop, and I got very good results. Also, the ducks. Uh, so I was shooting ducks with that as well, 
and they don't sit still. They sort of just you know move around as they feel like it. And then I, nonetheless, I had no trouble getting good focus using these two focusing aids with a 20, 200 millimeter f 3.5 lens. So yeah, it works fine. Um, what else? So I think that about covers the viewfinder. Uh, functionality. I want to compare the T2 now to two other well-known SLRs. First, the Nichromat. There, there's. I think that the auto reflex has a great deal in common with the Nichromat. They are both built like a tank cameras, um, and they both use Copal Square shutters, which I really like. I've done a separate video on Copal Square shutters. Um, I just think they're one of the greatest inventions since sliced bread. Um, uh, one of the best photographic uh, 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 inventions of the 20th century, in my opinion. Um, so the uh, the Copal Square shutter and a built like a tank camera, that's a big deal for me. Um, so the Nichromat lacks automatic exposure. It, it is match needle only, uh, as opposed to the auto reflex, which offers the, um, um, automatic, the automatic exposure via the, um, um, uh, the, the needle capture system I described. Again, assuming that you um, get the meter calibrated and, um, and voltage converted, which you, you may or may not feel like doing. I have not, I, I just haven't bothered. Uh, the T2 lacks mash needle uh, manual um, uh, metering, so when you, meet, when you meter manually with the uh, T2, you're still going to see this needle indicating the suggested um, aperture, and you just have to sort of decide which, you know, which, which aperture you think is appropriate, and, and you can set it manually if you like. Um, and you, the way you do that is you simply take the lens off the EE. Um, Konica, or, well, Konica AR series lenses all have a setting that says either EE or, or AE. EE stands for electric eye. That's what um, um, built-in light meters were called in the 1960s, electric eye. Um, and then you, uh, so this, would, this lens is now set on automatic exposure. And to put it on a, um, a regular aperture <clears throat> number, you would simply push this, depress this button right here and move the and move it around like so um, and like most auto reflex excuse me like most hexanol lenses this is the 52 f18 and it features intermediate half uh, half click stops some people like that others do anyway um, so Again, if, um, continuing with, with our comparison with regard to the Nichromat, um, the T2 features more conventional control placement. The Nichromat has, is a bit quirky in terms of its control placement. I've done a separate video on the Nichromat quirks in which I go over all the various um, sort of odd, unusual aspects of the Nichromat cameras, which, um, uh, which put some people off, um, but you know, not, not me. I think, I think they're just phenomenal cameras. But the auto reflex does feature more you know, conventional control placement. Um, you know, advance, shutter speed. Um, you know, you've got, you, um, here's the uh, you know, standoff position is right here. You lift this ring to turn the, uh, uh, to turn the ASA dial, you lift that up. There you go. Again, that's very conventional, uh, typical of the period. Um, rewind crank, like so. The only really non-conventional, and here's your, your, um, release button to, um, to disengage the take-up spool before you rewind. Uh, battery door, again, th this is all very typical, very conventional layout for uh, cameras made during that period. The only somewhat unconventional feature really is the, the method of opening the back of the uh, camera. On most cameras of this era, you would pull up on the, um, um, on the rewind crank, whereas on the auto reflex, you simply open it up like so with, by pulling down on this little latch right here, and that pops up, and then that, that pops open the back. Um, so the T2 features a conventional control placement as opposed to the Nichromats. Otherwise, they're very similar. These are built like a tank camera with Copal Square shutters. Um, and I think this is what I'm, I'm preaching. I'm preaching the gospel of these two cameras, the Auto Reflex and Nichromat. I think this is what people should be investing in because they're going to last. They will last forever. This camera is built like a brick outhouse. Um, I mean, it is, it is just, it's, it is rock solid. Um, just like the Nichromats. I really think that, that the auto reflexes and the Nichromats are the two best deals in 35 millimeter SLRs available today. And they're worth investing in. I mean, you invest in one of these things, you get it fixed up right, it'll last you. you know, I mean, you, you, you won't have to do any more work for it, work to it for quite a while. Um, I also want to compare the auto reflex to the Canon AE1. 
because at the time it would have been considered more of a competitor to the AE1 due to its automatic exposure function. So again, this comparison is really only relevant if you have um, invested in getting the meter calibrated and voltage converted, or you've, you've you know, solved your mercury battery issue and calibrated the meter. Um, in which case, you know, uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at whether you would be you know, better served doing that or getting a, uh, an A1, which sell for much, much more. A1s are far more popular, although the popularity is not, in my opinion, justified, and I'll go over that now. So the Canon is smaller, lighter, and it uses much more plastic. Um, notoriously, the Canon A-Series battery doors tend to uh, break off. That's a very common problem with the Canon A-Series. And the shutter speed dial, the AE-1 has like this over, oversized shutter speed dial that sort of overhangs the edge of the camera, which is fine because it's um, the idea was that you should be able to like turn the, the dial easily with your finger while you're, you know, without taking your eye from your viewfinder, which is great, except they use this cheap plastic and, and on a lot of AE-1s you can see wear mark, the, um, the, the, the serrated edges are completely worn down um, because Canon just used cheap plastic um, for that particular part. Uh, the T2 offers battery independent reliability, okay? On an AE1, if the battery ain't working, you got yourself a paperweight. It's not even heavy enough to use as a doorstop. Um, whereas the auto reflex is, is perfectly usable without a battery. Um, again, I have not put batteries in this. I mean, I did when I initially bought it just to see if the meter was anywhere close to accurate. Um, it wasn't. So, I mean, I just haven't bothered getting the meter calibrated. I just, it's, it's, it's not, not worth the hassle in my opinion. Um, and I've been using this thing meterless, uh, which means I just I don't put battery in, batteries in it, and it works just fine. Um, all functions other than the automatic exposure system and the light meter work just fine. Um, so the T2 off also offers an exposure hold function. The AE1 does not. Now, although the T2, it's um, if you if you um, get your meter reading you like, you do a half press on the shutter release, hold it, and then you can recompose and fire. Um, so the, when you, and when you do that half press, that's when that needle or the, that little mechanical arm is, is grabbing the, the, uh, the needle, um, holding it stationary and then you recompose and take your, excuse me, and take your shot. Um, the AE-1 does not offer an exposure hold function. It's a major drawback to a camera with, uh, with an, a, um, an electronic shutter. I mean, what, what's the point of an electronic shutter if you don't have an, exp uh, without an exposure hold function, really? The AE-1, however, offers um, SPDs versus CDS cells. That is, the, the AE-1 uses um, silicon photodiodes, which are um, uh, much more reliable, um, and, and it's, it's a superior um, technology versus the old cadmium sulfide photocells, which uh, tend to lag a bit in terms of responsiveness, and they can be thrown off by really bright light. They need to recover. Um, it takes a few seconds or a few, a few moments to recover from like a, uh, from an extremely bright light source with CDS cells, whereas the SPDs, uh, the silicon cells, are much more responsive um, and generally have held up better over time. However, in a recent interview um, on YouTube, one of the camera store or camera rescue or camera repair, camera rescues, this is the folks in Finland, um, mentioned uh, in a YouTube interview that Canon A-series cameras are all coming in uh, and the overwhelming majority of them are off by one or two stops uh, in terms of uh, light meter accuracy. So uh, it, it, I question how well the Canon A-series electronics have, have weathered the years. Uh, the A1 also offers electronic accuracy. Again, big question mark. That used to be a big um, um, advantage of an electronic shutter. That is the, the timing, the, the shutter timing. You were absolutely sure that one you know, 500th of a second was exactly one 500th of a second, whereas on a mechanical camera, um, it might vary a bit. Um, and that is true, but um, I think that over time, that, that, that the, the accuracy advantage um, is, um, is no longer uh, as relevant a factor as it once was. Number three, the uh, AE-1 offers the split image rangefinder focusing aid in the center of the focusing screen. Again, that would be uh, right here. Um, the AE-1 has a, a split image rangefinder surrounded by a micro prism, which is this, um, plus a ground glass focusing field, so it has an, a, an additional focusing aid. Um, and it has no, mer no mercury battery issues, although it does, well, no mercury battery issues. That, that's fair to say for the AE-1. Um, but nonetheless, the, the, the plastic construction and the, um, the comment by the, um, the camera 
uh, rescue folks uh, about the inaccuracy of the meters over time. I mean, these were consumer products made, what, in the 1970s and 1980s? I mean, does anybody seriously expect a consumer product to, to last 40 years and maintain its accuracy and reliability? Um, I mean, this, you know, it's, I, I don't know. I, I think it's a no-brainer. I, I would take a, um, an auto reflex over an AE1 any day of the week. Um, all right, so that about wraps it up for uh, my review of the uh, Auto Reflex T2. This is definitely a camera uh, worth considering. It is the most commonly available of the Auto Reflex series, this and the TC, although the TC is a bit of a different critter due to its smaller size and use of plastic. But I will, I do have a TC and I will be reviewing that uh, more fully. I, I did a, um, I think I did a preview of the TC some time ago, but I'll, I will do a more full, complete review of the TC here in the, uh, in the not too distant future. Um, but uh, of the metal, metal auto reflex uh, cameras, the T2 is the most common, um, and it is worth investing in. And when I say investing in, that's what I mean. Nowadays, when you buy a 35 millimeter SLR, unless you're buying a cheapy little you know, point and shoot, uh, you're making an investment. Um, and if you get one of these and you make the investment to, to, uh, to in getting it um, uh, cleaned, lubricated, adjusted, overhauled, um, get it back up to spec and functioning, then you have got yourself an extremely reliable piece of precision equipment that will last you the rest of your life with minimal uh, maintenance. Um, these, these things are just beautiful mechanical pieces of art. Uh, the auto reflexes, the Nikromats, and many of the other a bit like a tank series cameras that I mentioned as well. I personally favor the Copal Square shutter, which is why I'm pushing um, auto reflexes and Nikromats. Uh, but if, you, if, if the cloth shutter is, is your thing or you think there's an advantage to that, then I would encourage you to look into a Canon FT or FTB or Minolta SRT series. Uh, maybe Pentax Spotmatic. So um, that's. Um, that's what I've got for you today. I hope you found this video informative and helpful. And if you did, please do like and subscribe and check out the links below. Thank you so much. Great to have you along. See you next time. Take care. Goodbye.